Okay, Bob. So <clears throat> as soon as I, as soon as you see me turn to Jim and just say hello, Jim, you can you can start with my turn and uh, go from there. Thanks. Well, hello, Jim. Hi, Chris. Part two. <laughs> Part two. Here we are. Yep. All these years later, and um, it was really fun looking at your 500th guitar and sharing that with everybody. It was spectacular guitar and spectacular being mm -hmm. in front of Anna. And, um, as someone who's known you for a long, long time and seen many, many versions of your guitars, I'm always impressed with how consistently good they are. Uh, it's not uncommon to have a, uh, some builder build one great guitar, one mediocre guitar, one maybe not so good guitar, but it's, it's a little bit uncommon to have somebody build consistently great guitars. and. You've done that all over the years, whether it's been a lattice or a double top, and I, I kind of wanted to chat with you for our listeners a little bit about um, how how do you achieve that consistency? What is what is the different things that you think about or are trying to achieve with a double top versus a lattice brace, and where are you headed? Where have you been? Where are you now? And where are you headed with both styles of guitars? Okay, you might have to remind me of a couple of points of those. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a big, big stuff, question, right? but um, uh, so I probably should explain the difference between a double top and a lattice guitar first. Um, so the lattice guitar was, of course, pioneered by Greg Smallman in Australia, and um, the way it works, well, both guitars are trying to achieve the same thing, but from different directions. Yeah. Um, in a lattice guitar, the top is thinner than a traditional guitar. And the bracing is made mostly of a matrix of balsa wood with carbon fibre. Yeah. The double top was pioneered, of course, by pioneered, of course, by Matthias Darman in in Germany, and um, he's trying to do the same thing, but he's making a, a hollow core guitar, yeah. um, typically Nymex, sometimes balsa wood, um, with less bracing. Yeah. But both soundboards are roughly the same weight, and it's oh. it's that reduction in weight. Of the soundboard which makes the guitars louder than a traditional guitar okay um so i'm one of the very few builders i think that build in both styles i uh, yeah um, could be i'm not aware there might be others but there might I, be others i'm but, not aware of them but uh, um so i mean my interest in lattice building of course came about because of because i'm an australian and i started building in 1986 yeah. um and and basically uh, that was the template which most Australian builders followed but then uh, later on I became interested in the double top purely because I'm just always interested in the, you know new ways of understanding the way the guitar works and I um, and I, I had been to Germany a couple of times I've met some of the German builders we have a mutual friend in, yeah. in Wilfred Holter who yeah. is like the I call him the godfather of, of the double double top guitar Hold on. Bob, I have to edit that out right before we're going to take a brief cut um, and edit out Wilfred's name. He doesn't like it. No. Okay. So just 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 before he mentions Wilfred's name, he's, he's just going to talk about some German builders, perhaps. So we'll take it right, as soon as I turn and look to him again. Yes. Yeah, so the double top was pioneered by Matthias Darman in Germany, um, and. Basically, it's trying to achieve the same thing as a lattice guitar, but the top is thicker and it's filled with a core, sometimes Nomex, sometimes balsa wood, and that lightness um, of the top is what produces the volume, um, it, as well as in the lattice guitar, it's the same, same thing. So a lighter top is more easily driven by the bridge of the guitar, um, and therefore it's more efficient at producing sound. Um, so I think your original question was about um, how I maintain a consistency of sound. Yeah. Um, so I think my guitars have changed a lot over the years, yeah. but, I've, but I've always sort of used the best materials I can find. I've always done my best with them. And, and, and uh, I think they've just become slightly different in my taste in guitar, my ideal sound I was going for. Um, perhaps a little louder over the years they've mm -hmm. become. Yeah. Um, but my way of building is very much like a, um, it's like a process of evolution. So I have notebooks and I record a lot of details about the, um, the frequencies that things are oscillating and vibrating at when I put it together, you know, mostly the soundboard, but also things like necks and backs. 
I have all those details written down. So um, as I build my instruments, there's a natural variation in the instruments and the ones that are moving more towards my ideal sound, I study uh, the particular frequencies and the way they um, propagate through the guitar and I tend to move towards those, um, those guitars and try and replicate them and I, I make small changes. Having said that, every now and again, I make a, a, an experiment, kind of like in evolution, if there's some oh, genetic yeah. variation that comes up and a new species arrives or something like that. So I, I'll be doing these radical experiments oh. that usually aren't guitars to sell. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I make these um, small adjustments to instruments that I like. And over time, it's, these guitars have sort of morphed and evolved into, into my current models, small changes, sometimes big leaps. Um, and it's interesting to look back through my my notes and my books because I can uh, I can see these points um, when when they occur where I've, I've moved in a new direction, but I can't always say when it's going to happen or why it's going to happen. But my intention is always to make a better and better guitar. I, I think I've you know one of the things I always say to people is because I studied to play guitar at, at Elder Conservatorium in Adelaide. Um, I understand what a guitar should feel like yeah. from a player's perspective, and I also understand how a concert guitar should sound. And um, I think that's a big advantage. You know, there's a lot of guitar builders that make great guitars, but but many that don't play themselves that I know of. Uh, and I think it's a huge advantage to be, uh, you know, trained and play the classical guitar. Yeah, I I don't think I could have um, I could have evaluated the instruments and made those improvements without having studied yeah, knowledge. Yeah personally without having studied the yeah. instrument. Because it's a lot about how it feels when you pick it up. Yeah. And even Anna said to us yesterday, um, she can tell straight away. She picks the guitar up and she yeah. can tell within... Gets an impression instantly. Like two notes. Yeah. Whether she's going, she's interested or it's not. Mind, yeah. um, so, I mean, it's very much like that. You, you, you tend to feel the instrument and it's got to speak on a lot of levels. It's, it needs to be comfortable to play. I mean, everyone talks about the sound and the volume, of course. But the instrument's got to have balance and beauty of sound, beauty of tone. Um, it's got to feel comfortable to play. Yeah. Um, it's got to inspire someone. I, and I, I really want an instrument that a, that a player um, feels like is leading them in a new direction rather than them having, having to uh, you know, control it and adjust what they're doing. I want, to I want an instrument to open new possibilities for a player. Yeah. What do you... When you look back on the guitars that you started with and, and look at the guitars you're building now, what do you think the biggest leaps were for you? You know, what, from, from the guitars you're building now to the guitars you started building way back when, mm. what were those aha moments? What were the biggest aha moments that you had? Uh, well, I mean, first, I think consistency. So um, I used to, I, I'm pretty, I'm very picky about the instruments I send out. and. You, you know, when you say that, um, you know, you always see good instruments coming from me, that's because I have a pile of instruments at home <laughs> that I didn't send. Well, I used to. Um, yeah. So in the early days, I would build, say, five guitars. Yeah, yeah. And one of them I yeah. wouldn't be happy with. Right. Um, and I, d I did, would never send that guitar. I would um, study it, mm -hmm. try and improve it, deconstruct it yeah. if necessary. Yeah. Because an instrument which... That I wasn't happy with teaches me as much as an instrument I am happy with. Interesting. Because yeah. you know, if you've done something in your notes and you really don't like that instrument for whatever reason, what did I do different in those notes? So yeah. whatever I did different is what you don't do again, or what you do the opposite of. Yeah. Um, so as far as aha moments, I think um, I think it's an understanding. Like one of the things I remember, an understanding of the physics of it. So one of the things I remember is talking to a speaker um, designer, someone who made hi-fi speakers, and they said to me, um, they were telling me about how the speaker works, and I said, well, the lightness of the cone, the, you know, how much it weighs, is the efficiency of the speaker, or how loud the speaker will oh, be. Oh, oh. Um, the stiffness, so the material the cone of the speaker is made out of, and how stiff it is, um, is relevant to the brightness or the darkness or the tone of the speaker and the flexibility of the edge of the speaker 
is um, is the base response. Mm. And it occurred to me that this is pretty much what we're talking about with guitars yeah. because um, the guitar top needs to move like a speaker and um, the understanding that it's not just moving as one big speaker but there's small sections of the soundboard which break up into smaller like tweeters in a hi-fi system. Um, and this is all occurring within the instrument and when you start to understand that um, you start to think about the sound in more in terms of um, like how the human ear works um, and what frequencies we need to hear to make a, something clear and pleasant to listen to. And also I, I did a, I'm also, you know, an amateur um, recording engineer and, um, you know, just for other people really and sometimes music I play. Um, and I got into mastering music and what happens is after you record a piece of music before it goes to a CD, it goes to a mastering engineer yeah. who then adjusts the EQ uh -huh. or the equalization and the frequency of the sound so that it sounds nice on a recording. And you can get a you can get a sort of a muddy, badly recorded piece of music, and if you turn it up loud, it's still a muddy and badly re recorded piece of music. Okay. So volume is not as important as what I call openness of sound. Uh -huh. And if you to fix a muddy piece of music, you need to scoop certain frequencies, typically about 300 hertz. Oh. And, and you need, usually need to give a little bump around the areas which the human ear is sensitive to. So it's getting technical here, but five, let's say 5,000 to 800, 8,000 8, hertz. Okay. Um, and that makes something clear. So you can have a guitar, if you take the analogy of a guitar, you can have a guitar which is not as loud, but it's very clear. Yeah. We can have a guitar that's very loud and kind of muffly. Yeah. And it really doesn't matter to the human ear unless you do a direct comparison, which one's louder. Oh. Um, so that, that kind of, that understanding that I have to chase those certain frequencies within a guitar and, and try and get them working properly to make, firstly, a clear guitar and a balanced guitar, and then hopefully keep improving the volume. It's interesting you mention that, Jim, because I had a, a, a very, very well-known artist here in the shop playing one time, and I asked him about, uh, we happen to be talking about double tops or flies to lattice guitars as well, but uh, you hear a lot of chatter on the internet that uh, uh, these guitars, are, they're just loud, and, and that's all. The only reason people buy them is because they're loud, or, or I hear sometimes a comment that, well, I just sit in my bedroom, I don't need the volume, but what I'm hearing you say and what I hear when I hear these guitars and what I heard from this artist and what I've heard from other artists uh, is that the volume that comes with a lattice guitar or a double tap is almost like a, an extra benefit, but it's not the primary benefit. It, they, these artists and these people that play them, they're looking at the wide dynamic range, they're looking at the, the physics of the guitar, um, they're looking at the tonal character and quality, and the fact that it happens to have volume is sort of like almost uh, a, a lucky happenstance, but it's not the prime reason they buy them, but it's, they buy them for all the other reasons that you buy any guitar, and they just happen to have volume as well. So when you're chasing the ideal in your mind, you were telling me the volume's a natural part of that equation, but you're also now looking at the different modes that the top moves, the primary modes and the secondary modes, and how how do you sculpt those to create the sound that you have in your head? Yeah, well, I mean, firstly, with, with volume, um, it, it's super important to players. Obviously, they want to have a powerful instrument. It's like having a fast car. You know, you drive a fast car, I've been in your car, um, <laughs> but you don't drive it fast all the time. But it's nice to know it's got that potential. And um, some of the, my favourite performers um, that I watch, you know, are able to play very delicately on an instrument and then and then they can all of a sudden, you know, push it. Yeah. Maybe, maybe once in a concert you get that the potential of the guitar that's heard. Yeah. But that means that when, whilst they're playing softly, you have this perception as an audience member that they're holding holding something back. Right. And um, and that creates excitement, of course. And tension, and, yeah. And the ability to express yourself through through the um, you know, through your performance of the guitar. Um, and that's why I'm excited by by loud guitars. But as, as far as, uh, what was the question you were asking about how, how I go well, about? Well, as you're, um, as, since the volume's important, mm. but the tone and the character and the dynamic range and all the other aspects yeah, are perhaps primary, how do, you, how do you sculpt that 
with a soundboard yeah. to create well, what you have in your head. I think anyone that tells you that they understand what's going on, you know, is lying, <laughs> um, because it's it's such a complicated system, and yeah. really you've got to try things and and you've got to adjust things and and try and come to an understanding of it. And everyone has, then has a picture of of perhaps what makes the instrument work. And the interesting thing is, for some builders, they'll do something totally different. Um, and have a different result. Or sometimes in your building career, you will have think you've worked something out and it did work for that particular design, but then it changes on subsequent guitars. So, so it's kind of a moving target. But yeah. there's a few things which I think about, which is, is one is, is the material you're building the guitar off. Every piece of wood, everything in that guitar is like a little graphic equaliser. Uh -huh. And a graphic equaliser is one of those things on a stereo system where you pull down you pull down different the frequency, different yeah. frequencies. So, yeah. for example, um, the graphic frequency of, uh, of you know, something like a piece of glass um, it is, you know, might have quite a high sort of a um, boost around the high frequencies because it sounds like brutal. Whereas, you know, a piece of cardboard um, will, will not have very many highs at all. So, uh, you know, and have more kind of that dullness of the, of the lower mid-range. So, Everything that's in the guitar, the sound is moving through. Uh, all the vibrations are moving through the instrument. And, um, and when they move through those materials, those materials can subtract frequencies. Mm. So a good guitar is, I've always say, the good, a good guitar is the one that's the worst at dampening frequencies. Okay. So what you want to do is, there's a certain amount of energy that's going into the soundboard. Mm. Um, that's flying around in the instrument looking for something to do. It has to be, it can't disappear. It's got to be converted into friction or sound or something. So if it can't be absorbed by the material, then it's got a better likelihood of coming off as sound. Okay. Um, Didn't so, you mention to me that something like only 5% of the potential energy is actually used or something in that? That's energy? what I've heard is, yeah. is like 5% uh, of the energy of the string is is converted to sound the rest is lost so the so the, the less you can lose to use your analogy the better that guitar is going to be yeah um so that's one thing the other thing is because the the soundboard of the instrument is like a speaker cone um it has to move mm -hmm. um and the more it moves the more sound it makes because that soundboard displaces the air which then you know makes the vibrations sound sound waves travel through the air and hit your eardrum and um, so physically you have to make a design which resists the pull of the strings but still allows the top to move in a controlled way. Um, that's really important as well. Also making an instrument that produces the frequencies that the human, he human ear is most sensitive to. And you know, I've always found it interesting that you could put a set of headphones on and you can hear a very deep bass, but that deep bass isn't actually being produced by the headphones. What we're hearing is a series of harmonics above that, but our brain thinks it's hearing the bass and creates it. Interesting, yeah. So um, this sort of all this happens in an instrument. You know, you can sometimes we hear things within an instrument because of the, the stack of harmonics in the sound and the way that the sound is composed, and we may hear things that you know maybe are not present. And sometimes it's it's a matter of sculpting the frequencies within the instrument. In, in a way that you're, it's, it sounds loud and clear. A lot, a lot of the way we hear volume is about the percussive attack of a note. Mm. So um, I believe a percussive attack has to be fast. And mm. one of the ways to get a fast attack is to have a more lightweight top and, a, and perhaps a lightweight bridge mm. um, so that we get a, a, a quick attack transient, mm -hmm. which we hear as volume, and then a, and then a long sustain. Mm. Um, and you know, this has been been proven that uh, you can have a sound that's louder with a slow attack that actually sounds quieter than, a, than an instrument with a fast attack. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is how a flamenco guitar works. Oh yeah. We see it as being powerful, but if a classical player typically it's picks up percussive. picks up a flamenco t guitar, they don't they don't think it's a powerful instrument, yeah. and yet you can hear it really clearly over singers and, mm -hmm. and, um, and other instruments mm -hmm. because of the way the sound propagates and the mm -hmm. travels. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do, you, um, do you find when you're working on a lattice guitar versus a double top, do you have a totally different mindset? Uh, are, they, are they really 
totally different animals. Yes. Yeah. Totally different. So um, when I talked before about you know keeping track of the frequencies and then um, you know moving towards the better guitar and trying to recreate those. Uh, those sets of frequencies are totally different in the, the soundboards when they're off of the guitar. When the, when the soundboards get glued on the guitar, they become the same yeah. or, or, or close to it. Like typically we have a, um, most guitar builders would measure, the first thing they would measure is the air cavity resonance, which yeah. is, mm -hmm. is the resonance, like if you blow across the top of a bottle and make a sound, that's the bottle's air cavity resonance and uh, resonance and, and and everyone would know if you if you put liquid in that bottle it raises the the resonance if you take liquid out it drops the resonance okay. uh, to a lower frequency how do you achieve that with a, when you're building a guitar well there's a few ways so lots of things influence the the fundamental resonance the sound, size of the sound hole is a big factor mm. we don't usually change that too much so then it becomes the flexibility of the top is the number one thing um, and the and the volume of air the instrument holds so a larger instrument tends to have a lower resonance the same way a, a bottle full of air as opposed to a bottle half full of water will have a lower resonance sure. um, there's also the flexibility of the of the back and sides uh, which play a role but there's other resonances as a, um, the top tends to break I mean if I show you on this guitar the, the top in its first mode of resonance, um, this is the air cavity resonance. Do you have a, an air guitar. cavity resonance range that you, you, know, you think is ideal? This one's F sharp, huh. which is, um, I like F sharp. Um, and there's a lot of builders now building lower than F sharp. Mm -hmm. um, and it depends on what you like to sound. I mean, lower than F sharp tends to be a big, loose, mm. you know, op open guitar. but. Um, Traditional guitars are sometimes as high as you know, B flat, particularly a factory guitar. Huh. A lot of even very well-known um, you know builders from the 60s, 70s, 80s, even now would build G or G sharp. F sharp's kind of like a it's low, low enough to get a, a deep resonance, but not so low as you know perhaps it's going to shock a few people with how loose and low the, the instrument sounds. Oh, yeah. So it really depends on what the builder's aiming for. Okay. So I tend to build it at F sharp. Hmm. Um, on, the, on the double tap and the lattice, you, is yes. it the same? Yeah, it's not always that. Sometimes I'll go for F, but hmm. it's usually about F sharp. Okay. Um, so the first, the first way the soundboard vibrates is is as a big, you know, a big sort of speaker cone up and down like this. Yeah. And that tends to be an, about you know an octave above the air cavity resonance. Okay. Um, at a slightly higher frequency, it'll start vibrating this way, which, which is this area might be moving down while this area is moving up and it sort of rocks about the central nodal point here. Kind of like a seesaw. Like a seesaw. And then you get a seesaw happening this way mm -hmm. at a slightly higher frequency. And those are the three most important No, it just keeps, no. keeps going. So then, then you get a combination of the last two, which is the top moving uh, like this. Okay which is four areas moving. And then it starts to break up into a more chaotic sort of pattern, smaller areas, um, which tend to amplify the higher frequencies of the instrument. They're the ones that I'm, I'm really interested in because really? they're, they're like the little tweeters in the, in the, in the hi-fi right. system, and they produce the high frequencies, which makes the instrument sound open. I mean, that's very sim simplistic because there's lots of sure. there's other things that happen. Like the back, the back influences the sound, small areas on the sides, the stiffness of the sides. Even the neck, we said. Yeah. There's a stick resonance of the instrument, which you can, it's probably too hard to hear because it's very soft, but yeah, it's a very low frequency. And um, that's the entire instrument oscillating. Um, and that just happens to be a nodal point there. So okay. when I hold it, I can hear it. Oh. Um, so um, that's kind of a really quick overview about how, it's not, this isn't just specific to my guitar, mm. how all instruments work and propagate sound. The difficult thing is everything you change within an instrument affects everything else, which is why it's so difficult for any one builder to, um, you know, copy another builder oh. because you take someone from someone something from someone else's guitar and put it in your guitar as a builder 
unless you do everything else exactly the same, it's going to have a different effect. But if you go back to the basic principles, which are the materials, how you thickness them, what their dampening qualities are, um, those things you'll find consistently in, in very high-end guitars, is very high-quality materials, mm -hmm. very meticulously made mm. um, and carefully thickened. Do, yeah. and, and do you control those nodes or, or create the sound you have in your head primarily? Is it... Is there a primary component, that, like the bracing, perhaps, mm. or is it is it so um, amorphous that every component helps you sculpt that sound, and you really can't single one out as the most important way mm. to sculpt the sound? Yeah, a, a lot of builders think that the bracing is the most important thing. So I've heard that lattice bracing, fan bracing, um, whatever bracing that. that you know, you get radial bracing, you get instruments even with no bracing sometimes. Yeah. Um, and what I see it as is, is that the bracing is there as a structural component. So the instrument um, is under the tension from the strings and you need to stop the instrument collapsing. It wants to collapse in on, its, on the sound hole. Just... Yeah, if you take all the bracing away, it'll just cave in and collapse. So uh -huh. the bracing has to be strong enough to, to stop that happening. But the bracing will get in the way of the vibration of the sound. Mm. So um, you need to have as little effect on the free vibration of the soundboard as possible. So the bracing has to be very carefully um, planned and adjusted and designed to spread the load through the instrument whilst allowing the instrument to move freely. Mm. Um, and that's why really the best and loudest guitars tend to be very lightly built, um, uh -huh. and uh, yeah. particularly in the bracing. I mean, you'll get, you'll get a guitar with weight sometimes, but the, the vibrating part of it on the soundboard um, is usually very lightly built on the best instruments. Um, so it's really a problem, it's a design problem. Mm -hmm. um, how, do, how do you do this? Yeah, uh, how do you do it? Do I mean, something, something that, uh, that I really, um, you know, that really um, was one of those wow moments we were talking about before, was when I realised that um, everything that I previously believed about strutting a soundboard stiffly, like putting um, diagonal um, transverse cross braces across, like some of the early Spanish guitar, yeah. or the seventy Spanish Down guitars, across the treble area, you know, um, you know, adding these braces with the hope of reinf you know reinforcing the treble frequencies, making the guitar yeah. brighter. Um, I see that as being totally wrong. Hmm. Um, because I, I make guitars without any of those cross grain stiffnesses, and yet they're very bright. Yeah. In fact, you know, sometimes I, I want, I feel like I, I want to mellow them out a yeah, little okay. bit. When you get a brand new guitar, that's not such a bad thing because they tend to yeah. mellow with time. Um, but that's because um, I, I use this idea of the small areas acting as tweeters. Okay. Um, right. And as for me, putting a, a stiff um, cross brace doesn't actually reinforce the treble. What it does is it attenuates the bass. Oh, okay. So it's kind of like turning the bass down on your stereo. So then the treble appears to be appears louder. Appears to be louder, even though it's the same. Yeah, it doesn't actually make the treble louder. No, no. I mean, it might be for some other people. Like I said before, what works for me doesn't necessarily work for another builder. Sure. Because there's certainly some amazing guitars around yeah. with transverse braces in them. I'm not saying throw your guitar away if it's got a transverse <laughs> brace. It's just okay. what works for me. Yeah, okay. And for me, that was a wow moment. Wow, I can take away all of this bracing, yeah. make the top very loose, and yet it's still a very bright instrument. Okay. So the way I control the, the brightness of my instruments is more with the thickness of the top. So okay. um, a thick top guitar tends, tends to sound thicker, like a thick drum skin. Okay. On a drum, yeah. uh, whereas a thinner top guitar tends everything else being equal tends to sound brighter. Okay. Because these little small areas of the material uh, are able to vibrate more and, and let off more high frequency. Hmm. Yeah. What um, what we talked a little bit uh, at lunch about um, the neck and other components of the guitar. Even the tuners I've heard builders talk about, you know, wanting the lightest tuners. People tend to think that you know. First off, the sound comes out of the hole, which I think is not, not exactly the case uh, totally, but also that the soundboard's responsible for everything. It, is it true that the other components, or at least in your guitars, do you, do you factor them into the sound? Are they part of the sound? 
Uh, yeah, well, like I mentioned before, each part is like a graphic equaliser. Um, so if you put a very spongy piece of wood up on the neck, it'll tend to um, attenuate some of the trebles because they'll get absorbed into the material. Um, the sound hole, like you said, it's not actually a sound hole, it's a port. So it allows the air to move in and out of the instrument. Having said that, you know, you do get people that put those sound ports yeah. inside of the guitar and the reason they work is because it's kind of like opening a door. Uh -huh. you, you can hear, hear the, you can hear the under side, of, side of the soundboard. Yeah. It, it doesn't necessarily make the instrument louder out in front, but it makes it louder for the player, perhaps. It gives a little bit of a stereophonic effect. It gives you a little kind of a, a peek into the yeah. sound. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, the, that's, that's all part of the design and, um, of, ha of how you put the instrument together. Yeah. So, as the double top has evolved and your lattice braces have evolved, and I've watched them over the year, they, they've always been amazing. And it's sort of like I was talking about Anna's playing, you know, just when you think she's achieved some pinnacle, she, she goes beyond it. Mm. And I notice that with your guitars, just when I think like, how oh, these are amazing, how can they get any better? You'll find some ways to squeeze a little something else out of them. And so what, what is it that drives you? Where are you, where are you going in your mind's eye when you strive in that way? And are the two styles um, heading in the same direction so they may converge or will they always be two separate animals? Yeah, it's interesting. My lattice guitars um, have now evolved to a point where um, people will play them and not think it's a lattice guitar. Mm -hmm. Like like not just any old people, like I'm talking about concert artists who know my guitars. Yeah. And they'll pick up a new lattice and go, oh, I love this guitar, is it a double top? Huh. And to me that's a great compliment because yeah. they yeah. because I'm trying to build out of the instrument um, any unusual character. I want it to sound like a, a beautiful traditional guitar yeah. and I want more response and more volume. Mm -hmm. But what, what drives me is really, um, you know, it's it's not a financial thing. Uh, you know, obviously building um, a very loud, responsive guitar is easy to sell. Mm. Uh, it's more, it's I do it more for the um, my quest my quest, sound quest. I don't. I'm, I'm, I don't want to use the word artistic quest or anything, but um, it is that, yeah. But it's you know it's it's that being able to give a player something which inspires them. It's like like when I give a player a guitar, and they play it, and they all, all of a sudden say, "Wow, I just heard a new voice in that in in that fugue I've been playing for uh, yeah, like yeah. ten years." It's like a new piece, and I've, I've just heard a new voice in yeah. it, you know, or. This guitar has made me so much better as a player, or yeah. I find this guitar so easy to play that yeah. I can now it's 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 raised my playing to another level. Yeah. So those sort of things is what uh, what motivate me is is working with people just to make great music and and also collaborating with other luthiers. I've got some good luthier friends who we share ideas and we're not always trying to build the same thing, but we uh, we all have this great interest in sound and we're all coming from different directions and um, it, move, it collectively moves in a way that hopefully uh, keeps the genre exciting and keeps the players excited and I mean it's been a fantastic time for guitar builders hasn't it the last it's a fucking renaissance yeah the last 30 years yeah. that I've been a builder um, and it is 30 years I'm, I've been building over 30 years yeah. now um, yeah. it's been incredible I mean we've had you know, we've gone from these traditional guitars and these, these two builders I mentioned earlier, Greg Small and Matthias Dolan, um, kind of gave us other builders the permission to to experiment because, uh, you yeah. know, there was these great players using their instruments and, and then we've taken those ideas, you know, and, and moved forward with them and put our own ideas in it. But the foundation of the instrument really, you know, the design and it all goes back to Torres. That's for Torres, yeah. And, and Torres is I, I played with Torres recently. Yeah, um, amazing. Uh, you know, friends friend's house, I won't mention, but a friend who has a Torres. Yeah. And it it's amazing. It's like the, the instrument's, you know, still perfect, yeah. plays surprisingly loud. It's surprisingly loud. Um has the same frequencies that yeah. I'm chasing in my guitar. Yeah. And the tone is, you know, it makes you want to cry. Yeah. I mean, it's it's yeah. that tone that 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 really drives me as a guitar builder. Um, that I'm 
I'm looking for mm. um, and, and trying to marry with with extra volume and, and uh, you know, it's a fantastic quest. What a great, you know? uh, yeah, those, those Taurus guitars are they're inspirational to everybody. Yeah, yeah they're fantastic. So, so just touching on the, the, you know, what I've, what I've done with the lattice. So right. um, when I started building lattices, um, it was because I was a, I was a young builder and I, I didn't have many orders yeah. um, and I was self-taught. I just came out of nowhere. Um, and some and someone asked me if I could build a ladder, like a dealer asked me if I could build a lattice yeah, guitar. So yeah. I'm sure I'll build a lattice guitar. <laughs> and prior to that, I built a few guitars in the flatter style because that was the best. Yeah, I remember. Best, yeah, it was the best instrument that I'd had access to. Yeah. And, um, yeah, yeah. And so what I did is I, I bought, I built my version of a lattice guitar, which was nothing like a smallman because I hadn't seen a smallman. Hmm. Um, so I, typically, it had a thicker top. It wasn't heavy. Um, and it, I kind of chased the same sort of flexibilities as a flatter. So yeah, yeah. for quite a number of years, you know, my lattices were known for sounding quite flatter-like. Yeah, I remember, um, yeah. Um, and I think I took that and, and I ran with it. You know, like it, for me, it was like I didn't want to copy um, what Greg was doing. Um, I wanted to make my own niche. And I saw that there was a space between the sound of the lattice guitar and the sound of a traditional guitar, where, mm -hmm. where someone wasn't quite ready to go to that modern sound, yeah. but they wanted a bit more power. Yeah. And my early guitars w were a little bit more powerful than, than a, um, a traditional guitar, mm -hmm. not as powerful as a small man, mm -hmm. um, but they sounded very traditional with a little bit of extra yeah, pushing. Like a hybrid, yeah. Over the years, I've brought the volume up, uh -huh. and, and now yeah. they're, they're really quite a loud guitar. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're a powerful instrument, totally. but I've, I've had to work very hard to keep that tone because as you get more volume, it becomes more and more difficult. Is it more of a challenge to... Everything gets amplified. Yeah, you know, yeah. Any problem in the instrument gets amplified. Um, you know, so you have to continually make adjustments and continually make balances. But um, I'm happy now with my design, so I've reached a point in the career where, where I feel they're loud, they're traditional sounding. Um, and I've, I'm, I'm now just refining the things. I'm not, I haven't made any drastic changes in a while. But having said that, I'll probably go home and make some drastic changes. <laughs> yeah. What do you see, uh, to kind of bring things to a close, um, we chatted briefly the other day about wood and, yeah. and the future of the guitar and the, and the materials. And, you know, we're already starting to see some high-tech materials like Nomex and others. Um, find their way into the guitar. You've got uh, Ovation and other people building guitars out of alternative materials and uh, with all the CITES restrictions and the, the, the sustainability of certain woods, what, what do you think is going to happen? Well, it, it's, the wood that we're using now is, has already been cut. Yeah. So um, there's very little tone wood now that's been cut. So yeah. it's old stock. Yeah. So obviously it's going to run out. I mean, if, if you start building guitars if you're starting a building career now it's difficult um it's even it was very difficult for me in australia because you're at the bottom of the world and there was no fine wood dealers so i started off um finding it very difficult to find good wood um the primary primarily the the best wood for the soundboard is spruce or cedar um, mm -hmm. and it's hard to find a material that has that strength to weight ratio um, the introduction of Nomex and carbon fiber has been great, but the, the instruments are still primarily based on a wood soundboard. So yeah. I think we're going to have to accept moving forward. We've already accepted that the back and sides materials have changed. You know, there's no Brazilian rosewood left. Yeah. Um, uh, Indian rosewood is really difficult because it's also on, on restricted listings. Um, so builders have started using other woods and, and I, I don't really feel that um, there's a problem with that. I think you can make a perfectly good guitar of many different woods yeah. with backs and sides. Spruce and cedar is difficult though, but I think we just have to accept that the wood is running out and there's, there's builders now that are using woods that maybe wouldn't have been considered acceptable yeah. you know, 20 years Not ago. Not too long ago, yeah. Um, but the techniques of using those um, woods have improved. So the, inst this, the instruments are still sounding better and better these days. Uh, but yeah, it's a real worry. I, I mean, um, I do have some ideas about building 
out of synthetic materials, right. um, which I'd like to experiment with. Okay. But it's going to be, you know, if I do that, I mean, I have plenty of cedar, so yeah. for my lifetime, yeah, um, I have a supply enough for my lifetime of the number of guitars I'll build. Yeah. Um, but I'd love to be part of a development, you know, to um, try and introduce some synthetic materials. It's going to be very hard to overcome the, the expectations of the market. Yeah. Because there's still players that just expect these beautiful guitars well, used to yeah. and these beautiful woods and uh, we need to really treasure what's left yeah. of those woods because um, you know the population keeps growing on the planet and there's more guitarists than ever and yeah um, personally I, I I donate money back to um, revegetation projects in yeah. Australia because I I feel an in that responsibility I'm a woodworker I'm using that yeah um, but I also feel that adding value to those timbers like i recently went to canada and i saw um, pallets of beautiful cedar that had been cut up going for building materials you oh. know shingles on houses and oh, yeah. beams and things and and yet the, the, i visited a wood dealer that was finding it very difficult to find any wood to cut for instruments i think by value adding these woods you make the resource more um, more valuable, so it's less likely to be wasted. Yeah. Okay. But one of the problems, of course, is illegal logging in in um, all over the world. Yeah. All over the world, and um, yeah, it's tough. Yeah. Uh, and this economy dying out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wonder. Yeah. I wonder where we're going with it. Yeah. I do too. I. Uh, yeah. My fingers crossed. For, we're living in the golden age. We need to get it. You know. Need to get that special guitar and and hang on to it and um, <laughs> it's a yeah. family pass it down for generations. It's it's only going to get more difficult yeah. to find these woods and uh, you know what I do is a very specialized field um, and uh, you know I'd, it'd be tough to be starting out now. Yeah. Well, we're lucky to be living in the times we're living in, and um, mm -hmm. I'm lucky to have this 500th guitar here along with you and Anna. It's been a special treat. Um, thanks so much for coming to Santa Barbara here and bringing this amazing guitar and uh, everything over the years and for everything you give. Uh, you've got so many fans, I can't tell you how many times in a week I get calls from people about you and your guitars and, mm. and Anna playing your guitars and what they sound like. And, um, and I've been selling them to clients for, you know, for close to 30 years myself now. And uh, one of the rarest things in my shop is a used red gate. And that's because people just don't want to sell them. And I think this is a lot about what you do, Jim. So thanks from everybody. Oh, thank you. And thank you for everyone that's supported my instruments as well over the years. Uh, yeah, awesome. Thanks for listening. Bye. Thanks, Jim. See you, Chris. All right, Bob, you can cut it. Well, I think that was a good, a good chat.